gonna make a sequel to that little intro, I think. I didn't have final cut on that. Hi. I also didn't get my homework in time. Just doing it last minute, so I don't have it in the nifty pretend that I'm not really reading this. So you'll know I'm reading this. Okay. Haven't given a speech ever. Very encouraging, I love you. So, I'm at my hairdresser's. He's gay, go figure. And he's asking me about this event, and I say, yeah, the HRC wants to give me an award. Uh, really, he says. Award for what? I say, well, I guess it's kind of for being myself. <laughs> he's like playing with my hair and he's looking at me at, hmm. Yeah, I guess you make a pretty good you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, there wasn't a lot of competition. And then he, because he's a catty bitch, he goes, yeah, good thing. Just imagine if you had lost. <laughs> so I, uh, I've been going to this hairdresser who's this gorgeous, lovely man for almost six years. He knows everything about my family, how close I was to my grandma, how I met and married the love of my life. He did our hair for our wedding three years ago. He's seen the drunken, pornographic pictures of our honeymoon in Mykonos. <laughs> but he doesn't know that I directed the Matrix trilogy. <laughs> with my brother, Andy. And... So he knows all about who I am, but he doesn't know what I do. Conversely, I was recently out to dinner with a mixture of friends and strangers who were all very excited to meet a Hollywood director. But all they want to do is ask about Keanu Reeves, Tom Hanks, and Holly Berry. <laughs> and throughout the dinner, they repeatedly refer to me as he or one of the Wachowski brothers sometimes using half my name, La. <laughs> as an awkward bridge between identities, unable or perhaps unwilling to see me as I am, but only for the things I do. Every one of us, every person here, every human life represents a negotiation between public and private identity. For me, that negotiation took a more literal form in a dialogue between Andy, Tom Tickfer, our new brother by love, <laughs> who's just gorgeous, with whom we directed our latest movie, Cloud Atlas. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for the plug. Go see it. Uh, several months ago, we were sitting in this Berlin club amidst beer-soaked haggardness of a space not intended to be inhabited by people and sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to decide if we should shoot this introduction to a trailer for our movie that's about to be posted online 
Tom Hanks was supposed to do it, but now he was unavailable. Andy and I have not done press or made a public appearance, including premieres in over the 12 years. People mistakenly believe that this has to do with my gender. It does not. After The Matrix was released in 99, we both experienced this alarming contraction of our world and thus our lives. We became acutely aware of the, pre the preciousness of anonymity, understanding it as a form of virginity, something you only lose once. <laughs> anonymity allows you access to civic space, uh, to a form of participation in public life to an egalitarian invisibility that neither of us was prepared to give up. We told Warner Brothers that we decided we didn't want to do press anymore. They told us, <laughs> no. <laughs> this is, uh, they were absolutely not. This is non-negotiable. Directors are essential to selling, marketing a movie. We said, okay get it. So if it's a choice between making movies or doing press, we've decided we're not going to make movies. Oh. I said, hang on. <laughs> like, maybe there's a little room for negotiation. <laughs> so we, this, uh, this position and that negotiation was being re-examined in Berlin three months ago. All of us are conscious of the fact that not only will it be Andy and my first public appearance in a long time, but it'll also be the first time that I speak publicly since my transition. Parenthetically, this is a word that is a very complicated subject for me because of its complicity in a binary gender narrative that I am not particularly comfortable with. <laughs> Yet I realize the moment I go on camera, that act will be subject to projections that are both personal and political. I have been out to my family and friends for over a decade, and the majority of that time I've been discussing this, this particular moment, <laughs> with my therapist, <laughs> my family and my wife, because I know eventually I'm going to do it, but I also know that there is going to be a price for it. I wasn't sure how it was going to come out, I just knew that I, when I finally did come out, I didn't want it to be about my coming out. I am completely horrified of the talk show, <laughs> the interrogation and confession format, the weeping, <laughs> the tears of the host. <laughs> Who's Sympathy underscores the inherent tragedy of my life as a transgendered person. And this moment fulfilling the cathartic arc of rejection to acceptance without ever interrogating the pathology of a society that refuses to acknowledge the spectrum of gender in the exact same blind way they've refused to see a spectrum of race or sexuality. So the three of us talk. We like to talk. You're probably realizing right now, uh-oh, we got a talker here. <laughs> there will be an intermission after about an hour or so. <laughs> uh, and we're alternating perspectives, quite conscious of the fact that we have just made a film about this subject about the responsibilities human beings have to one another, that our lives are not entirely our own. Uh, there, and there is dialogue from the film merging easily with our discussion, and I find myself repeating a line from a character who I was very 
attached to, who speaks about her own decision to kind of come out. She says, if I had remained invisible, the truth would stay hidden, and I couldn't allow that. And she says this aware that, that even at the moment she's saying it, that the sacrifice she has made will cost her her life. Suddenly I begin this very intense rush of images, thoughts and memories going through my mind, a kind of life flashing before my eyes that happens, people describe near-death experiences. As it begins, I start to understand just how complex the relationship between visibility and invisibility has been throughout my life. I remember the third grade, I remember recently moving and transferring from a public school to a Catholic school. In public school, I played mostly with girls. I have long hair, and everyone wears jeans and t-shirts. In the Catholic school, the girls wear skirts, the boys wear pants. I am told I have to cut my hair. I want to play four square with the girls, but now I am one of them. I am one of the boys. Early on, I am told to get in line after a morning bell, girls in one line, boys in the other. I walk past the girls, feeling this strange, powerful gravity of association. Yet some part of me knows I have to keep walking. As soon as I look towards the other line, though, I feel a feeling of differentiation that confuses me. I don't belong there either. I stop in between them. The nun, I realize, is staring at me and then she's shouting at me, and I don't know what to do. She grabs me, and then she's yelling at me. I'm not trying to disobey, I'm just trying to fit in. My silence infuriates her, and she starts to hit me, and suddenly, most improbably, if it happened in a movie, you would never believe this, but there's these screeching tires, and my mom suddenly <laughs> just happened to be driving by. <laughs> Like, totally true. She jumps out of her car, she hurls herself at this nun, rips me away from her, rescuing me. She warns her never, the nun never to touch me again. And I have. And I think I'm safe. But then she takes me home, and she's trying to understand what happened. But I have no real language to describe it. I just stare at the floor, and she keeps asking me over and over what happened. And I begin to feel the same frustration, the same mounting fury that I felt with the nun. She tells me to look at her, but I don't want to, because when I do, I'm unable to understand why she can't see me. The last time I was asked to make a speech, like this one, as my eighth grade graduation. <laughs> I was valedictorian of my class, and Mr. Henderson, my teacher, informed me that I got to give a speech as a result of being valedictorian. I didn't think this was a very good deal. <laughs> I'm not sure about this little award thing either, but. <laughs> Being painfully shy, I declined. I said, let someone else be valedictorian. <laughs> he didn't like this answer. <laughs> he said, that's not how it works. He said he understood how I felt. No one likes giving speeches. Why do we do it? <laughs> but uh, I had to. I had, sometimes I had to think about not just myself. I had to speak for my class, and I had to speak for my parents, who would be very proud of me, he said. There are some things that we have to do for ourselves, but there are other things that we do for other people. So I wrote this speech back then, much as I wrote this one with butterflies churning. I worked on it at night wearing the slip that I used as a nightie that I had stolen from my sister. <laughs> I wrote about the way 
that knowledge had an actual materiality, not unlike the materiality of a ladder that could be used to gain access to places and worlds that were previously unimaginable. I have no real memory of giving that speech. I remember afterwards being in the bathroom, hiding in a locked stall, feeling the slip I wore under my suit as I cried, feeling stupid and that I was a liar because I was unable myself to imagine a world where I would ever fit in. In high school, I joined theater department partially because of my older sister, but mostly because of the storeroom high above the stage amongst the catwalks that was filled with costumes. I fell in love with this storeroom as much for its dust-scented privacy where I would sit and read as for the racks of dresses and endless rows of shoes. <laughs> I remember wearing this beautiful brocaded dress one day with a built-in corset when suddenly I heard the stage manager calling my name. Just before she opened the door, I dove desperately into the shadowed folds beneath the rack dresses, heart pounding like a mouse, listening to her call my name over and over, praying that somehow I might remain invisible. As I grew older, an intense, anxious isolation coupled with constant insomnia began to inculcate an inescapable depression. I have never slept much, but during my sophomore year in high school, when I watched many of my male friends start to develop facial hair, I kept this strange, relentless vigil, staring in the mirror for hours, afraid of what one day I might see. Here, in the absence of words to defend myself, without examples, without models, I began to believe voices in my head that I was uh, a freak, that I am broken, that there is something wrong with me, that I will never be lovable. After school, I go to the nearby Burger King and I write a suicide note. It ends up being over four pages. <laughs> A little talkative. <laughs> but it was addressed to my parents and I really wanted to convince them that it wasn't their fault. It was just that I didn't belong. I cry a lot as I write this note, but the staff at Burger King have seen it all before. <laughs> and they seem immune. I was very used to traveling home quite late because of the theater. I know the train platform will be empty at night because it always is. I let the B train go by because I know the A train will be next and it doesn't stop. When I see the headlight, I take off my backpack and I put it on the bench. It has the note in front of it. I try not to think of anything but jumping as the train comes. Just as the platform starts to rumble, suddenly I notice someone walking down the ramp. It is a skinny older man wearing overly large 1970s square style glasses that remind me of the ones my grandma wears. He stares at me the way an animal sta the way it, he stares at me the way animals stare at each other. I don't know why he wouldn't look away. All I know is that because he didn't, I am still here. Years later, I find the courage to admit that I am transgendered and that this does not mean that I am unlovable. I meet a woman, the first person that has made me understand that they love me not in spite of my difference, but because of it. She is the first person to see me as a whole being. And every morning I get to wake up beside her. I can't tell you how grateful I have been for those two blue eyes in my life. Sydney, Australia, I finally came out to my family. When I told my mom what was going on, she jumped on a plane immediately. There was this big, tear-soaked baptism. <laughs> and she confessed that she'd been afraid to, uh, to come here to arrive and grieve the loss of her son. 
but when she arrived, she found it wasn't so much as a death as it was a discovery, that there was this other part of me, an unseen part, and she felt it was like a gift because now she could get to know that part of me. We went to dinner, I dressed as feminine as I could, wanting to be seen by strangers as Lana, hoping that waiters would not call me sir or he, as if these people suddenly had the power to confirm or deny my existence. My mom is also a bit talkative. <laughs> she always introduces herself to the waiter, waitress. And she's like, hi, I'm Lynn, this is my daughter Lana. And the waitress smiled and said, wow, she looks just like you. <laughs> when my dad arrived, he shrugged it off. <sighs> Easier than accepting that his wife and daughter had once voted for Jane Byrne instead of Harold Washington. A choice that still rankles him today. He said, look, if my kid wants to sit down and talk to me, I'm a lucky man. What matters is that you're alive, you seem happy, and that I can put my arms around you and give you a kiss. <laughs> now, having good parents is just like the lottery. You're just like, oh my God, I won the lottery. <laughs> What the? I didn't do anything. <laughs> I remember thinking about my dad's words, his acceptance of me when my wife and I first read about Gwen Arruyo. It seemed impossible that something like that could happen so close to this city, and yet here was this person like me, murdered by ignorance, by prejudice, murdered by intolerance, it seemed in direct inverse proportion to the kind of acceptance my of my family, murdered by a kind of fear that seeks to obliterate any evidence that would prove that the world is different from the way they want to see it, from the way they want to believe it to be. Invisibility is indivisible from visibility. For the transgender, this is not simply a philosophical conundrum. It can be the difference between life and death. A few short weeks ago, after my coming out, three of us, Tom, Andy, and I were being interviewed. One of the reporters ventured away from the subject of the film towards my gender. Imagine that, a reporter. <laughs> my brother quickly stepped in. Look, just so we're clear, he says, if somebody asks something or says something about my sister that I don't like, understand I will break a bottle over their head. <laughs> Few words express love clearer than me. <laughs> I am here because Mr. Henderson taught me that there are some things we do for ourselves, but there are some things we do for others. I am here because when I was young, I wanted very badly to be a writer. I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I couldn't find anyone like me in the world, and it felt that my dreams were foreclosed simply because my gender was less typical than others. If I can be that person for someone else, then... then the sacrifice of my private civic life may have value. I know I am also here because of the strength and courage and love that I am blessed to receive from my wife, my family, and my friends. And in this way, I hope to offer their love in the form of my materiality 
to a project like this one started by the HRC. So that this world that we imagine in this room might be used to gain access to other rooms, to other worlds previously unimaginable. Thanks very much.